The structure of the internet means that watching it in one place can cause fossil fuels to be burned in another. Which is not to say that watching Netflix makes you an industrial polluter or a bad person, because it doesn't. Um, but I do think that it's just so easy for so many of us to be disconnected from the consequences of our consumption. Um, and this particular issue is one of many that demonstrates um, how closely we're all connected and that we all have a vested interest in solving these problems. And so now, I'm very pleased to introduce tonight's speaker, presenting the acclaimed new book, Inconspicuous Consumption. Tatiana Schlossberg is a journalist and former New York Times reporter whose work focuses on climate change and the environment. Her work has also appeared in The Atlantic, Bloomberg View, Yale Environment 360, and The Vineyard Gazette, among others. Her book, Inconspicuous Consumption, was selected as one of the New York Times' most anticipated titles of August. Bill McKibben, writing for The Times, said that you may come away from the book, you come away from the book with a stronger sense of the sheer largeness of the human enterprise, the number of us now consuming, and the overwhelming effect of all that volume. And Vogue said that Schlossberg perform, performs an elegant tightrope act. She's written a treatise on climate change that is upsetting but not hysterical. It is scary, it is scary informative in both senses, but also oddly enjoyable. Please join me in welcoming Tatiana Schlossberg. I'm, I'm going to talk um, tonight, um, instead of reading from the book, it, there are some passages from the book that are kind of woven into my talk, but I thought hopefully this will be slightly more engaging. Um, so I'm guessing that everybody here um, believes in climate change, or better yet, knows that it's not a question of belief, but rather one of physics, and that the question has long since been answered. We see ever more powerful examples of climate change every year. Just a few days ago, we saw the strongest winds ever recorded in the Atlantic as part of Hurricane Dorian. Climate change didn't cause this hurricane or any other, but it unquestionably made it more powerful, as it did with Hurricane Maria, Hurricane Harvey, Hurricane Florence, and all of the incredibly destructive storms that have wrecked our coastlines over and over again, with disproportionate impacts on communities of color and low-income communities in this country and on poor countries throughout the world. Um, hurricanes actually are what made me interested in becoming a climate change and environment reporter in the first place. Um, I was working as a municipal reporter at The Record in Bergen County, New Jersey, when Hurricane Sandy hit. Um, I couldn't get to work for two days because I was living at home in New York. Um, and then after that, I spent a lot of time going up, um, knocking on the windows of people's cars as they were waiting in line for ration gas. Um, and um, I interviewed tourists who were trying, still trying to see a uh, walk around in lower Manhattan and my sister um, lost power. Um, and I visited residents of a trailer park that had been built on top of a marsh uh, and flooded when a berm broke, destroying many of their homes. Um, I saw that our world was already being shaped by climate change um, and that no one, no matter their race or economic class, could be fully walled off from its effects. Um, some were more impacted than others, and again, these were often the people least able to recover, but that it was impossible for everybody to protect against this phenomenon. Um, and it became immediately clear to me, um, you know, by reporting that story and um, throughout my work that climate change is, is not just a science story or a nature story, even though we often um, historically have talked about it that way. It is a story about people, justice, health, politics, uh, inequality, the economy, infrastructure, and culture. Um, it was and is the biggest and most important story in the world. Um, so the, the following year, I went to graduate school where I studied history, um, and I read works of environmental history that made all of those uh, dynamics even clearer. So it was reading books like Nature's Metropolis and The Mortal Sea that I realized that while climate change may be an especially intense and new problem, we have been dealing with versions of it for as long as there have been people, and that we take life and the planet for granted, but it is always changing and responding, often to the things that we do, even if we are unaware of it. Understanding climate change as a local phenomenon, a regional one, a global one, and a cultural one is what makes me see this problem as a collective one. So, which brings me to my book, which is about exactly that. Many of us um, think about climate change in terms of hurricanes and other natural disasters, or else utilities and fossil fuels and airplane travel or, and red meat. Um, and those are all really important things to think about. But what usually doesn't rise to the surface is every average, everyday, um, run-of-the-mill stuff, including literal stuff, a pair of jeans, a hamburger, Netflix, or an air conditioner. Um, I wanted to write about these things and how they connect to the phenomenon of global climate change, not because they're more important than coal or forest fires, but because they're also part of the story. 
And for people who think that they're not science people or don't understand utilities, um, talking about climate change on this scale can help make the issue relatable and bring it down to the scale of our own lives um, and have it make sense kind of in the context of, of how we move through the world. So in my book, um, I wrote about four areas, the internet and technology, food, fashion, and fuel, um, to explore environmental problems that we don't often hear about and hopefully to help readers understand that our lives are inextricable from this problem. Um, but I, um, it's very important for me to tell all of you that I, um, this is not, none of this is to, um, I don't want to lay the blame for the climate crisis on individuals. I think so much of the conversation has been dominated by personal behavior as if, you know, we could have solved this problem many years ago if we'd all brought a different reusable bag to the grocery store. Um, so I think um, it, it, you know, there are a couple problems with that. One of them is it lets the people who are actually responsible for climate change off the hook. Um, you know, fossil fuel companies and industry and lobbyists and the Republican Congress people who take money from them. Um, but, and climate deniers. Um, <laughs> but instead, um, you know, we shouldn't feel individually guilty about climate change because, you know, we weren't involved in setting up the denim industry or um, the cattle industry. But um, and I don't think feeling guilty helps anybody. I think it makes feeling scared and ashamed or being made to feel ashamed of our behavior makes us turn away from the problem when really we need to all be facing it head on. So um, we should not feel individually guilty, but we should feel collectively responsible for building a better world. Um, and so, and that, which is to say, this is a problem that is too big to be solved by each of us individually. But that doesn't mean we shouldn't understand how all of our stuff and all of our own lives connect to the issue in the first place. Um, only by fully understanding this problem will we have any chance of knowing what will be required to fight it and making sure that those things happen. Uh, so now I'm going to talk about a few examples of what I mean. Um, I often get asked, um, you know, what surprised me the most in writing about this book. Um, and other than everything that I learned, um, I usually say the internet. Um, uh, sorry, I'm excited. Um, uh, so I didn't, I, as somebody who has very limited knowledge of computers um, and technology, you know, it, it had never occurred to me that the internet had any kind of environmental impact at all. Um, but um, as I kind of learned more about it, I learned that the internet is a very physical system. It's made up of um, wires and cables and modems and blinking routers around the world, but we so often talk about it as the cloud um, and know that our devices are wireless. So it's very easy to forget that it is um, a very tangible system. Um, and in the US, it's built on top of other very physical systems, um, the transcontinental railroad for one, um, and the telegraph and the telephone for another. Um, and because the internet was invented by the Department of Defense, as a way for the president to still be able to communicate with members of his cabinet in the event of a nuclear attack, um, much of the original infrastructure of the internet is in Northern Virginia. Um, in the early days of the internet, that meant access points for getting on the internet, which it still means that, but it also means that there are lots and lots of data centers there, which you may have ref um, heard referred to as server farms. Um, and there are so many data centers there and so much of the infrastructure of the internet that um, officials in uh, Loudoun County in Northern Virginia estimate that about 70% of global internet traffic passes through there. Um, so the reason why I'm, I'm bothering with all of that is that um, knowing that the internet is a physical system makes it much easier to understand that it uses a lot of electricity. Um, to keep the servers on and to keep transmission happening all the time in case we want to watch Netflix or shop on Amazon in our sleep, um, uh, you know, those, so those, both of, um, those sites are hosted by Amazon Web Services, which has many data centers in Virginia and also in Ohio. Um, so those data centers use a lot of electricity um, and the servers get hot, so they need more electricity to be cooled down and it's a very hot and humid part of the country or it can be, so it uses even more electricity. Um, so another reason that the internet is in some of the places that it's in, including Northern Virginia is because um, access to cheap land and electricity was really important to the development and growth of the internet. Um, and at the time that the internet was evolving, even more um, of our electricity than now um, came from coal. So um, 
this is overly simplistic and you can read so much more about it in my book. Um, I told somebody yesterday, they, they said I, I was doing a book talk um, and they said that I seemed like someone who could really get bogged down in details and I said I have never met a detail I didn't like. So, um, <laughs> but anyway, um, so I think, so what I'm trying to get at with all of this is to say that, um, you know, if I'm in Cambridge um, using the internet uh, using Amazon or watching Netflix, um, I may be causing electricity to be generated and coal or natural gas to be burned in Virginia or Ohio. Um, and the burning of coal in particular generates pollution known as coal ash, which is um, it's a byproduct of burning coal to generate electricity. And it is one of the largest solid, solid, <laughs> largest industrial solid waste streams in the United States. And we generate more than 100 million tons of it every year. Uh, it contains mercury, lead, arsenic, and more dangerous substances. And since it's what's left over from burning coal, it doesn't uh, biodegrade. And historically, power plants have stored it in water, so um, kind of dammed up in our artificial ponds um, next to the power plants because they use the water to flush it out of the power plant, so it ends up being stored in the water. Or sometimes it's stored in landfills. Um, but it can... Uh, if it's stored in water, it can seep into the groundwater um, and, you know, pollute drinking water and other natural systems. Um, I had never heard of coal ash before becoming a climate journalist, which is part of the problem. Um, even though in 2008 there was a major, um, a, a dam holding back a lot of this um, coal ash slurry in Tennessee broke and um, it spilled millions of gallons uh, of this waste um, burying 300 acres of land in Tennessee. It's one of the largest um, uh, disasters in American history, and I had never heard about it, and it happened in 2008. Um, so, but that, that is part of the problem. You know, people like me, um, you know, privileged white people living in cities are not exposed to coal ash and pollutants like it, and we have the luxury of not knowing about it. But coal ash is an unavoidable part of life for millions of Americans, mostly non-white, uh, poor and rural Americans. And so back to what I was saying before, the structure of the internet means that watching it in one place can cause fossil fuels to be burned in another, which is not to say that watching Netflix makes you an industrial polluter or a bad person because it doesn't. Um, but I do think that it's just so easy for so many of us to be disconnected from the consequences of our consumption. Um, and this particular issue is one of many that demonstrates um, how closely we're all connected and that we all have a vested interest in solving these problems. So, um, you know, understanding how this works um, is really important. Uh, you know, for those of us who had the luxury of not knowing what coal ash is, our lack of awareness is part of the problem, which I am addressing in a full chapter in my book. Um, but that's how these problems start and how they become so entrenched as to seem unsolvable. Um, so now that I've bummed everybody out with one thing, it's time to move on to another. Um, <laughs> So um, the other thing that I often say um, surprises me are the impacts of cheap cashmere, um, which is maybe something that should be an oxymoron. Um, but in, in recent decades, cashmere, which is made from the hair of a specific type of goat that lives mainly in Mongolia and parts of China, has become cheap for a few reasons. Um, the collapse of the Soviet Union, the opening up of China, and the Japanese recession, all of which we don't have time to go into right now. Uh, and, but, and it does seem slightly crazy that these big political and financial movements have made seismic changes in the world of nomadic goat herding on the edges of the Gobi Desert, but here we are. Um, so in Mongolia in 1990, there were about um, 5 million goats. Uh, and it's hard to get a good estimate of the current goat population, but uh, in 2004, it was around 26 million. Um, so it went from 19% of the livestock in uh, Mongolia to 60% of the livestock there. Um, and livestock of all kinds produce greenhouse gases, particularly methane, which has a very strong global warming potential. It's, um, um, so it, it traps more heat than carbon dioxide, even though it breaks up in the atmosphere um, more quickly. And livestock represent about 15% of global greenhouse gas emissions. Um, and about of that, about... 39% is from uh, their burps, and everybody always says that it's farts, but it's not, it's burps. Um, so it's very important to me that to set the record straight on that. Um, 
Uh, but anyway, <laughs> um, so these goats have an additional impact on this landscape, um, you know, in addition to the greenhouse gas emissions. And, and this is a, an area of the world that is experiencing climate change at a faster rate than the global average. Um, on average, Mongolia has warmed by four degrees Fahrenheit um, compared to one degree Fahrenheit for the rest of the world. Um, but back to the goats. So um, when the goats eat grass, they um, eat the whole plant, so they tear it up by the roots, um, which leaves the soil um, less stable, and they also have very sharp hooves, which um, in researching this book, every single article that I read about the goats' hooves um, talked about them being stiletto-like, uh, which felt very high fashion um, for a bunch of goats in Mongolia. But um, <laughs> it was appropriate for me because I was writing, I wrote about the fashion industry in my book. Um, but so anyway, so they tear up the plants and they break up the soil even further. And so all of, um, because the soil is less stable, it's less able, uh, it can't absorb as much moisture. And so it spreads across the landscape in about, um, I think it's around 900 to 1,500 square miles of additional desert every year um, in Mongolia, which I believe is about a, a Rhode Island of desert. Um, so anyway, um, so then that happens, and then the uh, winds come, and they blow that dust um, east to Beijing, where it combines with the um, soot from you know, factories there and coal-fired power plants uh, and adds to the air pollution there. Um, but... Additionally, um, especially in the spring, it um, travels, takes about five days to go across the Pacific Ocean and it reaches the west coast of the United States. Um, so in 2001, Asian dust accounted for 40% of the worst dust days in the western part of the US. Um, and LA experiences at least one extra day each year of smog with ozone levels exceeding federal limits because of Chinese factories making goods that they send to us. Um, and I think it's really important to remember uh, to remember that because we often, I think, talk about um, you know the pollution from China and coal plants there, and you know um, a lack of environmental regulations, all of which are true. But they're often making goods that they're sending to us, and so we are outsourcing our emissions to China. And so to pretend that that doesn't have anything to do with our habits here, I think, is um, short-sighted. Um, but that, so anyway, that is all to say that um, these problems are all connected and the lives we live in one place, which are an accident of fate to begin with, are not separate and distinct from the lives in another. These are problems we all share. The dust from desertification from Kashmir goat grazing and climate change and the soot and pollution from factories and power plants making clothing from that Kashmir blow over to the US in a karmic windstorm. It makes people sick in Los Angeles and Beijing. It makes the world warmer. It's all part of the same problem, and it's not just cashmere, it's everything. Um, so <laughs> uh, now uh, <laughs> I'll tell you what you can do about it. Um, so I, um, I think it's very easy for, for us to feel powerless um, in the face of these global systems, but I, I think the fact that we are all implicated in them um, makes an even more powerful case for collective action. Um, and so for me personally, as I went through the five stages of environmental grief while writing this book, um, denial, anger, trying to use less pl plastic, uh, depression, and determination, um, I came to realize in a new and powerful way that we are not powerless. Um, and here's an example. Um, in 1969, um, I, I, well, I guess I should say first, I think people my age and younger than me and a little older than me, um, don't appreciate what life was like before the EPA um, and how dirty cities were and that you couldn't um, play in the water or um, breathe clean air and, um, and, and what a dramatic change that has been over the last 40 years, um, 50 years. Um, so anyway, uh, in 1969, pollution in the Cuyahoga River near Cleveland caught fire for the 13th time because of the oil and industrial waste that were being dumped into the river. And there was also a massive oil spill in Santa Barbara. Um, the next year, activists and politicians organized the first Earth Day, which brought 20 million Americans to the streets. One of the organizers' goals was to get people to vote for a cleaner environment. And in the 1970 election, they targeted 12 members of Congress with the worst environmental voting records, nicknaming them the Dirty Dozen. Uh, when seven of the 12 lost, the impact went way beyond those seven elections. 
It sent a message to all the other lawmakers and led directly to the passage of the Clean Air and Clean Water Acts, two of the most consequential and effective pieces of environmental legislation in history. And we are seeing it happen again. The Green New Deal, the Sunrise Movement, the youth climate strike next week, the school walkouts, Extinction Rebellion, and more. Um, so, so I think that's a very powerful illustration of um, what can be achieved by um, people demanding government action on the environment. Um, and I, even when I say that, people then say, okay, but what about my genes? Um, and uh, I, I understand that impulse because, you know, right now when the federal government is um, actively doing things to make climate change worse and to make fighting against it more difficult, um, I understand the feeling that many of us have to want to do whatever it is that we possibly can. Um, but I'm not going to tell you to change your light bulb or to turn down a plastic bag. Um, not because those things aren't important. Um, and I do think it is important to live in line with your values um, and to pick the things that you care about and, and be consistent. Um, but just because those things aren't big enough. And so instead, here are three much more effective things that you can do. So one is to vote um, and to get involved in the political process. Um, there's an organization that was started here in, in Boston called the Environmental Voter Project, um, which uh, recognized that there was an untapped resource of millions of people who identified as environmentalists um, but didn't vote and has tried to get them to turn out. Because if those people vote and certain politicians get elected, then the um, climate change as a priority, the environment as a priority would rise further for those politicians and that they would know that they perhaps had to you know, make a, take a bigger stand. Um, but I also think, you know, voting, it doesn't end with voting. Um, you know, we have to make sure that the politicians are um, actually acting, and if they're not doing the right thing, then we don't have to reelect them. Um, but I, um, and also that, that's one of the reasons that I wanted to write this book was um, because I think having all of the information is what makes us more um, responsible and informed citizens and with, without kind of having the knowledge to um, challenge what people are telling us, um, you know, we can't do our job um, as citizens. Um, and secondly, uh, to talk about climate change. So about a third of Americans um, say they talk about climate change with their friends and family. They're all probably in this room. Um, <laughs> uh, and even fewer, about a quarter, say that they hear about it in uh, any form of media at, uh, once a week. So, um, but when people hear about climate change more, um, they're more willing to consider it a risk and to support policies to mitigate it. Um, so I think talking about this issue, buying a copy of my book for everyone you know, um, these are really good ways to solve climate change. Um, but, but I do think that, you know, that's really important because, um, you know, I think some of us, um, me included, um, tend to talk to people who agree with us or are interested in the same things that we are. But I think, um, you know, with this issue, this should not be a partisan issue. It shouldn't be a political issue. Um, it affects everybody, and it also represents an enormous opportunity. Um, so if you read my book or um, have read any of it, you'll probably notice that um, my tone is not one of doom and gloom um, and trying to scare you into action, but um, I, I want people to feel that climate change is serious and scary and can be a total bummer, as my talk tonight has shown, um, <laughs> but um, that it also is really interesting um, and that there are so many ways to become interested in it. You know, I became interested in it through history and um, through reporting, but, you know, technology, fashion, food, there are so many ways um, to become involved um, to become involved in the issue. And, um, and you know, I think we, people who care about this also need to communicate to those who are, um, you know, nervous about change that um, this is a, it's a huge opportunity and that a, like a lower carbon or carbon-free life is so much better, um, could be so much better for so many more people um, in terms of pollution and healthcare costs and justice issues and, um, you know, not to mention extreme weather events and all the sorts of things that we're seeing. Um, and then I think, uh, the other thing is that, um, you know, I've told you about certain things like the internet and cashmere that you feel are not, you know, it's not in your control to, um, 
make sure your cashmere sweater comes from the right goat herder. Um, <laughs> and I don't, it shouldn't be up to the consumer. Um, and it's not, you know, an, another a chapter in the book that I wrote is about denim. And um, it was a, sort of a way to talk about cotton because cotton uses a tremendous amount of water to be produced. So, um, you know, growing about two pounds of cotton uh, uses on average 2,000 gallons of water. Um, and turning, uh, making one pair of jeans can use up to 2,900 gallons of water. Um, but if I'm standing in the store, it's impossible for me to know which jeans were made using um, the least amount of water. So it really shouldn't be up to us to have to make those decisions. It should be up to the companies to not use that much water. <laughs> um, and, um, and, you know, we don't have to buy from the ones who aren't at the very least transparent about their practices. Um, and, you know, I think one of the reasons that I, um, it's, it's a difficult time to believe in government, but I do, um, because, you know, it's really hard to get 7 billion people to do anything, um, you know, without kind of these overarching structures. And so um, I think without kind of laws and regulations to make, um, you know, corporations as well as individuals act act better, it, it might not happen. So that um, so that's why uh, I do think that, you know, voting and being engaged in the political process is so important. Um, and yeah, so those are my three things. <laughs> um, so thank you all. And I guess now I will take some questions. Who's your favorite candidate? Uh, um, well, I really liked Jay Inslee. Um, he was the climate change candidate. Um, he dropped out. Um, but I, I really admired his um, insistence on uh, environmental justice as being an essential part of um, you know, how we structure the fight against climate change. And also, um, the, to me, the really exciting parts were that he wanted to talk about like changing zoning in cities um, because <laughs> Most people don't care, but um, zoning is one of the is is really important because um, obviously that affects kind of density and where housing is and where people live and work. And um, having people live and work in different places means that they're more dependent on transportation. Um, and without better public transit, which he also encouraged, um, you know, that just means more people commuting in their cars. And um, and so so anyway. <laughs> I liked Jay Inslee, um, but, uh, but I was very excited to see that um, Senator Warren had adopted so many of his policies. I'm wondering how you balance competing priorities, thinking of things like carbon pricing and the fact that frequently people who are low income, it, it's a regressive type. Of, uh, let me back up a little. Everything I've heard is that it cuts that down on carbon usage, but it's a regressive way to do it. And it often impacts most people who have the less financial means and don't have the alternative ways of getting the jobs and things. Mm -hmm. So the, the question was about how to balance um, you know, the need for something like carbon pricing with the fact that not everybody um, can afford that. So I think Generally, how I understand carbon pricing is that that's more for like um, utilities and companies that are causing pollution as opposed to sort of individuals. But obviously, in things like gasoline, um, it would be included there. I think um, it is a really um, it's a really difficult problem, and that's why you know, for instance, with Governor Inslee, why I was um, I was very excited to see his focus on on justice and on frontline communities because you know communities that um, will be most impacted by climate change and by a transition to a clean economy, you know, it's not fair for us to ask them to bear that burden again. Um, and so, um, I, you know, I think we need to have all stakeholders involved in that conversation. I don't have, you know, a, a right answer, um, but I, I do think that, um, you know, keeping these structural inequalities in mind is really important. But also, you know, I would say that um, not doing those these things is much more expensive than doing them. Um, and we are already paying for those costs. Um, you know, uh, usually, or low-income people, as I talked about before, are disproportionately impacted um, by not only climate change, but also by pollution, and particularly air pollution, which causes asthma um, and, uh, you know, other forms of lung disease. And so people are paying for, um, I mean, and those communities disproportionately suffer from those problems, and then they end up bearing the cost. 
and those responsible for the pollution don't. And so I think we also have to kind of change our understanding of what things cost. Did you get to the point when you were writing that you think that we should just ban blue jeans? <laughs> if you didn't get there, why not? Oh, the question was if I want to ban blue jeans. Um, <laughs> and also, um, you know, how I made it through writing this book. Um, basically, I, um, I think <laughs> knowing what I know now um, makes doing lots of things very uh, almost entirely paralyzing. Um, it's really hard for me to go to the grocery store um, and with, you know, in an hour <laughs> because I'm so conflicted about what to do. Um, and, um, you know, I think the, the same thing is true for so many of the, of the different things that I wrote about in the book, like denim, for example. Um, you know, one of the ways that I try to calm myself <laughs> down um, is, you know, some, some of the stuff that I talked about before, that this isn't, um, you know, really up to the consumer and that there, there have to be better ways to do it. And there are companies like um, Levi's, which has a program called Water Less, where they use um, uh, much less water to produce their jeans and also recycle a lot of the water that they do use. And they're making that technology available or those practices available to the rest of the industry. Um, so, you know, there are things like that. You can find brands that are um, doing a better job. But I also, um, I think my, my main takeaway from all of this for me personally has just been to try to consume less um, and to, you know, I don't necessarily need that new pair of jeans that I want. And it was very difficult to figure out what to wear on my book tour. Um, <laughs> but... Um, but yeah, just, you know, I think trying to reduce my impact in that way and, and knowing that I, you know, I'm not better than anybody and I can't do it perfectly. So trying to do the best that I can. So beyond dialogue and political action, what's the biggest small change that we can make? Um, I think the things that you've probably, oh, sorry, the question was, what is the biggest small change um, beyond voting and um, talking about the issue? Um I think, you know, the things that you've heard about before, like eating less red meat and not flying, are true. Um, and, you know, I think for one thing I wrote about in the book was, um, uh, like, food miles and whether local food made a really big difference. Um, and not to say that eating local food isn't a good thing to do, but um, you have to be really good at it to make as big of a difference um, eating local food as just by reducing or changing your protein consumption to like a vegetable or a grain one day a week. So I think that, um, you know, puts in perspective um, kind of how meaningful some of these changes are. Whenever I talk to people about, you know, the global warming crisis, and they always talk to me about recycling. Mm -hmm. and they say how much they recycle. And it's, I say, but you know, recycling is like the last thing, right? In order to recycle, you first have to buy it. Mm -hmm. It has to be manufactured. It has to be shipped to you. Maybe in cardboard. No place to put the cardboard anymore. You know, and then you have to get rid of it, and then they have to take it somewhere and process it and use, you know, trucks to do that and other equipment to do that. So recycling should be the last thing we want to do. You know, think about all the steps about not buying or about reusing or about repairing or about mm -hmm. going to, you know, the, I don't know, the goodwill and getting somebody else's or swap mm -hmm. shops on the internet, you know, like neighborhood swapping yeah. things. And so I'm just wondering if you have a way, because everyone's quick answer, students, my students, everybody is like, oh, but I recycle so much. <laughs> I'm such a good recycler. Like, how do you get people to realize that that's not it? <laughs> <laughs> um, I wrote a book. Um, no, I uh, <laughs> no, I think we do often forget about the re reduce and reuse part. Of, you know that those three things should should all be going together. Um, and I think you know part of the problem is that recycling has been I think the one thing that people have felt like they could cling to for such a long time, and it felt like okay, well, you know I didn't want to buy this thing that was packaged in plastic, but I couldn't help it, and at least I recycled it. Um, so, so I, I understand the impulse, um, but, uh, but it, it's, it's really complicated. And, and I think, you know, what, what I've tried to do in this book is to show that, um, uh, I mean, I, you know, I didn't write about like, I didn't write about recycling explicitly, but, um, you know, it, it really should be, I, I guess, okay. So a good example of, 
um, this problem is electronic waste, which I wrote about in the book, um, because we have you know e-waste recycling laws in this country. But um, even so, about a 70% of electronic waste in the US is unaccounted for. So we don't really know what happens to it. Um, and it's usually shipped abroad and recycled illegally, um, often by women and children with really significant health impacts for them. Um, so what I mean, so basically companies should be doing a better job of taking back our electronics to reuse the valuable materials that are inside of them. Like, you know, as your smartphone contains like 40 different kinds of metal and rare earth materials. Um, and mining those also has a significant environmental impact. So, you know, I think those companies like Apple or whoever else should do a, a better job of encouraging you to recycle and also, you know, not have a business model that relies on them releasing something new all the time so that we have to constantly buy a new thing. Um, and, uh, and, you know, or like changing the charger um, because, you know, those things, that is made of metal and plastic as well. Um, so I think, you know, recycling those kinds of things is actually really meaningful, but I think it, it does need to come from, from the top down as opposed to kind of us just recycling our plastic, as you say. Did you come across um, in finance now this uh, ESG, environmental, social governance, and uh, SRI, socially responsible investing? And that's, there's, it's coming along um, as a way that people invest in companies, pension funds, endowments, and trusts. And it, it is gaining steam, and I'm wondering if you saw that as an input to have more responsible companies by the investment that go into them? Um, so the question is about uh, environmentally responsible investing in sustainability. Um, it's not, it's not one of my areas of expertise, but um, I do think that companies are realizing that um, sustainability is not um, antithetical to profit and that it is actually really good for business. Um, and companies like Unilever are really good examples of that. Um, and there was just a big interview with the um, former CEO of, of Unilever um, ab about that problem exactly and that, you know, They've managed to they managed to do much better under his tenure by incorporating um, environmentally responsible and socially responsible principles. Did much better than Kraft, which does not. So I think there there are some powerful examples um, that you know that that we can point to, and I do, I do think it makes a difference. Is your sense of your research that in the fashion industry that they are trying to be more responsible? Obviously, for years, fast fashion, cheap cashmere mm -hmm. had been a trend. Now you do see retailers such, um, coming out with more limited, edited mm -hmm. assortments. But overall, do you think in the industry there's a focus on um, being more environmentally responsible? Uh, so the question is if I do think there is actually um, a focus in the uh, fashion industry about being more sustainable and environmentally responsible. Um, I don't know, <laughs> really, because uh, there is so much greenwashing in fashion um, in particular. And... For instance, like the September issue of Vogue had a lot about sustainability in it, but then there's Fashion Week right now and we're not hearing as much about it. Um, so uh, so it's it's really hard to know. And I, I think that, um, you know, uh, somebody like Stella McCartney is actually really doing a good job and making um, advances and making her reports um, and technologies available to the rest of the industry. And people are not adopting that quickly enough. I think, you know, she said something like, you know, we don't want to be the only ones. You know, we would be really happy if there were lots of other companies who were doing good things. So I, I think it, it is an area that needs a tremendous amount of improvement. Do you have any sense of uh, local community, uh, collective responsibility efforts that you want to say anything about? Or? Um, well, I don't live here, so I don't know. But um, <laughs> um, I do think... So, for instance, one of the chapters in the book is about um, food waste, um, and there has recently been reintroduced a food waste bill in Congress. Um, and so I think, you know, doing, and it's by a representative from Maine, but I, I think um, calling that representative or calling your representative and telling them that you really care about that bill because, you know, we waste about a third of our food in this country, um, which is a tremendous amount of resources. Um, water, fertilizer, emissions, um, and at the same time, about an eighth of Americans don't have enough to eat. So um, so I think, you know, there are small things like that where, it, you know, it doesn't seem like a lot, it doesn't seem every day, but the, it does 
really make a difference. Yeah, okay. So the questions were, the first one was about um, air travel and companies that require or encourage um, air travel for work and what the good uh, balances for that. And the second question was about um, the growth of the internet and electricity. So I would say for, for flying, you know, um, I know that companies require that. I think telecommuting is a, <laughs> is a good option to replace that. Um, I mean, that, that people are flying, like live in one place and then do projects for many, many months in another um, and fly back and forth every week. It seems really unpleasant to me in addition to um, uh, the, the climate impacts. Um, you know, I it's it's really difficult because I think for probably so many of us, we've always thought of travel as a really important thing to do in a way to be a good global citizen, you know, to expose yourself to different things and um, see other places. And so it, I, it, it, it feels, um, it feels very personal, I think, to a lot of people and people really don't want to give up traveling and I'm not saying that they should. Um, but I, I understand the conflict there. Um, not that it's a replacement or a get out of jail free card, but I offset my travel when I fly, um, either by, um, yeah, I mean, using accredited organizations that either pay for tree planting or um, for things like wetlands restoration or uh, installation of renewable energy capacity. Um, because I feel personally like if I have um, the luxury of being able to fly, that I can in some way pay for the consequences of that. Um, in terms of the growth of the internet, um, you know, the companies that, so most of the internet is now hosted um, by these kind of big cloud companies and hyperscale data centers. And they are, they do run very efficiently. Um, and I think Google in particular has made a real effort to be more efficient. And the internet, so the internet uses about, um, I think one to 2% of global electricity. So it's not by any stretch, you know, one of the bigger consumers, but I, I think just because it is, um, because people don't know about it, that's why I wanted to write about it. Um, but it would have grown exponentially had these companies not been focused on efficiency um, because electricity is their biggest overhead. So they really are doing um, a lot to address that. And um, Greenpeace and has put a lot of pressure on these companies to be transparent about their carbon footprint and their energy sourcing. And um, you know whether a lot of them are uh, either installing their own renewable energy or entering into agreements with utilities to build more renewable energy. So um, you know, there, there is progress in that area. Amazon does not release its carbon footprint. So um, if everybody wants to put pressure on them, that would be great. Um, so and so the, the question was if there's progress being made on calculating the externalities of um, production and um, climate costs, I guess. And, you know, I, I think it's exactly right. And I, I write about this in the book, especially in terms of shipping. You know, we think it's like cheaper to ship stuff from China because no one pays for the costs um, in terms of ocean acidification and uh, greenhouse gas emissions and sulfur dioxide pollution and lots of other fun things that you can read about in the book. But um, I uh, um, I think, so when I was working at the New York Times, I really wanted to try to do an interactive feature that was like um, the carbon footprint of your breakfast. And I um, got in touch with the, University of Arkansas Sustainability Institute, which is, um, uh, which they do, they do with Walmart, which is actually really trying to make a lot of progress in this area, which would be amazing because they're the biggest retailer in the country. Um, and what they found was that there was so little transparency in the supply chain that they were completely unable to actually nail down a carbon footprint for basically anything. Um, and so I think that's sort of where we have to start. And um, Companies are not really doing that um, that I that I'm aware of. Um, but um, you know, I think that's as I as I have been talking about. I think that's one of the the changes that we can demand as consumers is to really know where our things come from. I was wondering what your take on the Green New Deal legislation that's introduced in Congress is, mm -hmm. and if you think it goes far enough, or if it doesn't, and if you think something like that could ever really be passed. Mm -hmm. Um, so the, the question is what I think of the Green New Deal. Um, I, so I think I, I was really excited to see the Green New Deal um, because I think it's um, really important to um, introduce that kind of radical action into the climate conversation because I think we have been for so long 
um, just sort of talking at um, uh, at the margins of what really needs to change and that, that they were kind of trying to um, explain that this is an issue that needs to be addressed at all levels of society, you know, that it's not just electricity and transportation, it's, um, you know, it involves justice, um, it involves jobs, it affects, you know, every industry. So um, I think I may have missed something. I don't think that they've laid out like specific policies or, or bills that they want to get passed. And I would be, um, you know, hopeful that I, I'm, I'm looking for that. Um, and I think it really depends on who the president is and more importantly, who's in the majority of the Senate. Um, I, I hope that um, we can have some of the radical action that they um, suggest. Um, I mean, it, radical by our standards, not radical for what's needed, so. I'm very curious of your thoughts of how, or you spoke about the individual and the collective and how we need to shift blame back to the organizations and governance to address these structural problems. What are your thoughts on governance challenges related to carbon and other greenhouse gas extractive technologies as governments start contemplating this as a mitigation measure mm -hmm. and the potential for it for, say, just the United States or other nations or non-state actors to unilaterally deploy these and then impact other people and to just create more injustice? Um, so the question is about um, deploying uh, technologies that suck carbon out of the atmosphere and other gases, um, as well as I think about geoengineering. Um, so I, um, I'm not a, what some people in the climate movement call a techno utopianist, um, <laughs> which is to say, I don't, um, think we should be pinning all of our hopes on a technological solution to this problem. Um, you know, I think especially in terms of geoengineering, we don't really know what the impacts of something like that might be. Um, you know, and I mean, we do in a way because we put tons of pollution in, <laughs> into the atmosphere that reflects light and heat back. Um, and so, but anyway, um, and uh, I don't, I, and I think, you know, I hope that that develops as a technology and that, um, you know, that it happens in accordance with international agreements as opposed to, um, you know, um, kind of com countries unilaterally deploying any of these strategies. Um, but I, um, it's, again, it's not, it's not an area I know a ton about, but I, in general, I don't, you know, we don't have really time or the luxury to wait for a technological solution to this problem. Are, are there a couple of countries that you think are doing quite a good job uh, in this area, or? I think it was a huge step that um, the UK declared a climate emergency. I, th I think basically we see some isolated actions around the world. Um, you know, and I think countries like, um, you know, Costa Rica trying to be 100% renewable or carbon neutral, you know, in a relatively short amount of time. Um, but I think nobody's really doing enough. And part of the problem is that we have exited the um, position of global leadership. And it, um, you know, without us in the <laughs> Paris Agreement or really making any efforts at all towards this problem, I think it does let other people off the hook, which is, um, you know, not that the Paris Agreement solved all of these problems, but I think, you know, symbolically, um, I, I hoped <laughs> that it would have kind of um, helped make um, important progress in this area. Not that it would have been enough, but it was an important start. Once we read your book, yes. there are some other good voices in this conversation that we should be, that we should be paying attention to, especially some that we might not know. Um, what you probably know about um, Elizabeth Colbert, um, who writes for The New Yorker and wrote um, A Field Guide to Catastrophe and The Sixth Extinction, which won the Pulitzer a couple of years ago. Um, I would point to some of my former colleagues at The New York Times, um, Kendra Pierre Lewis, Louis, um, who knows everything. <laughs> um, and um, and uh, I think really, it, I mean, takes a... A similar approach, but also really as I do, but um, you know, focuses a lot on justice and transition um, and communities, but also an incredible level of scientific knowledge. Um, and I also um, I like Carolyn Corman, who's also at the New Yorker. Um, and in terms of books, you know, I mentioned two books that. Um, kind of helped me develop in this area, which are more works of environmental history, but I do think that they provide important perspectives. So 
One of them is Nature's Metropolis by William Cronin, which is about um, the relationship of Chicago to um, its environment and um, its kind of position as like a resource capital and that that's how it developed as the second city. Um, and The Mortal Sea, which is about uh, fishing the Atlantic in the age of sail and kind of um, how we have assumed, I think, um, that the whatever kind of population of fish or what, you know, in this case, um, we are we see is the baseline, um, but really we've kind of been um, at overfishing for hundreds of years. Um, and to kind of put that in perspective and um, see that we have failed to kind of look at the ocean um, holistically as, as an ecosystem has been a, a, a big failure. Uh, and I'll end on one, something else. Uh, um, I, I also really like Drawdown, which I don't know if people are familiar with, but um, it's a book and website and organization that, um, you know, is listing the 100 most effective solutions to climate change. So um, if you're interested in some of the technology um, and also kind of the costs associated with some of these different transitions, that is a good resource. So thank you all so much for coming. Thank you.